Are there any Americans here? <laughs> Anyone here from Canada? No. Any Europeans here? Excellent. Anyone here from London? The city's got 10 million people, not one of them's here. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter where you're from, you're most welcome here to Her Majesty's Royal Palace and Fortress, the Tower of London. My name is Mark. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Now, for the next five hours, I'm going to be your guide. I'm going to take you on a tour of the tower, point out some historic buildings, and tell you stories relating to them, OK? Stories, ladies and gentlemen, and not necessarily the truth. <laughs> I don't want anyone coming up to me later on going, oh, I think you found out the Duke and Arthur. <laughs> because I think you'll find I don't care. <laughs> Our story begins way back in 1066, when William, the Duke of Normandy, now known as William the... Conqueror! Defeated the Anglo-Saxon King Howell at the Battle of... Hastings. Hastings! Yeah, not quite so many of you joined in on that one. <laughs> Someone very proudly shouted Waterloo yesterday. <laughs> Anyone here from France? Here we are! <laughs> Get me my gun. <laughs> William was crown king, William I on Christmas Day of that year, but he had to continue to fight his Saxon subjects who did not take kindly to Norman domination. William was looking for somewhere to build a citadel to impress and dominate the citizens of London. He chose a site just inside the eastern city walls where once a Roman fort had stood. And in 1078, he authorised the building of his first royal palace and fortress in this country. Today we refer to it as the White Tower, and it's over there behind those buildings. And don't bother looking, it's behind those buildings. <laughs> Over the next 200 years, successive monarchs continued to add to the tower's defences. The inner bailing or defensive wall, containing 13 smaller towers, was constructed in around 1220. In 1280, King Edward I held a meeting with all his knights, and he said, We're going to build a wall. <laughs> it's going to be great. <laughs> Walls, great walls, and the Scots are going to pay for it. <laughs> and they did. <laughs> he built another wall with six small towers, all of which face south to defend against an attack should it come from the river. Another part of the tower's defence was this moat you're now standing in. This again was dug during the reign of Edward I. It was considerably deeper than it is now, and it was designed to make use of the tidal flow of the River Thames. For twice a day, a high tide, the river would flow in and around the moat and flush it clean. Does that sound like a good idea? Yeah, no. yeah it didn't work. No. <laughs> Over time, all the rubbish, raw human sewage, that's poo. <laughs> dead animals, dead tourists, <laughs> flow downstream into our moat and sink to the bottom. Over time, we successfully created the largest cesspit in Europe. <laughs> this situation continued for a period of 500 years. Imagine what it must have smelt like on a warm summer's day. Uh. It was the best line of defence we ever had. <laughs> in 1843 it got so bad they had to fill it up with sand and shingle to the level you see it now. So, as I said earlier, this was the first royal palace and fortress of its kind to be built by the Normans in this country. But over the years it's been employed in many other ways. For example, this is still the place where we keep safe the crown jewels and royal regalia and has been since 1303. This was the location of the Royal Mint where all the coins of the British Empire were designed and produced until 1810. The British Empire. Yay! Yay. Yay. <laughs> right. If you come from Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Canada, Zimbabwe, quite a lot of Africa, Gibraltar, Malta, Cyprus, the Middle East, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Singapore, Quite a lot of Indonesia, Malaysia, some parts of China, the Caribbean Islands, the Falkland Islands, the Pitcairn Islands, the Cook Islands, quite a lot of islands, including the United Kingdom and Ireland, and at some point or other you have been part of the British Empire. Therefore, I'd like you to join me in an enthusiastic and rousing huzzah! Huzzah! I'll teach you how to do it. Do it all properly right at the start. Something like this. The British Empire, huzzah! Like Let's have a go, shall we? British Empire! Huzzah! Very good, I'm mildly impressed. <laughs> Let's hear the Americans have a go. Huzzah! 
Rubbish. <laughs> By the way, you don't get to say who's up. You made your choice. <laughs> However, we have been getting on quite well recently, so I'm willing to give you guys a yee-haw. You can have a yee-haw. <laughs> so let's try that again. Everyone who's not an American, British Empire! Huzzah! America! Yee-haw! There you go. <laughs> yeah, that's why you'll never have an empire. <laughs> We used to have a prison here, a state prison, one of the most notorious prisons in history. There's the bars to prove it. Anyone from Australia? Welcome home. <laughs> <laughs> this is a place of murder, torture and executions. Now, talking of executions, when you leave the tower later on, go along there, go up the hill, go across the road and into the garden. And in the garden you'll find a large place on the floor. And that plate will tell you that that was the old permanent execution site. Many people died up there between the 14th and 18th century. Some of them were burned to death, some were hanged, and 75 men of noble birth were to lose their heads up there by means of block and axe. So just for a moment, let's pause and imagine the scene up there on the day of an execution. Thousands of bloodthirsty, unwashed, stinking peasants would have gathered up there for a day of fun and festivity. Fun. They'd have brought the children, grandma, and a penny basket. They'd be watching the jugglers, the fire eaters, the dancing bears, and the men on stilts. Everyone was having a super time. <laughs> Except for one. <laughs> the condemned man would have been let out of one of our buildings. He'd be wearing his finest clothes. He'd be dragged along there and up the hill to booing and jeering crowds and people pelting him with old fruit and vegetables. When he gets to the top, he's got to climb the big wooden steps. At the top of those steps, he's met by a giant of a man dressed all in black leather. Calm down, madam. <laughs> it's not what you think. He'd deliver a fine speech, say his prayers, and place himself down with his neck resting on a block of oak. He'd give a word or a signal. The executioner would bend down, pick up the heavy, clumsy axe, and bring it crashing down through that poor, unfortunate soul's neck. There'd be an ooh from the crowd. Ooh! There'd be a gush of blood. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> the executioner bent back down, pick up the severed and still bleeding head by the hair, hold it aloft for all to see and loudly proclaim, Behold, the head of a traitor, so die all traitors! God save the king! And the crowd would go wild and cheer. Wild and cheer! Wild and cheer! And the crowd! <laughs> the head would be impaled on a pike and carried from the streets of London to London Bridge, which in those days was the only bridge across the River Thames. The head would then be left displayed upon the gateway entrance, a sign of the fate that would await all would be traitors. Meanwhile, the headless corpse would be taken down, placed into a small hand cart, and brought back into the tower. It would trundle through the archways and up to the Chapel Royal, where we quickly buried inside the chapel in an unmarked grave. We're going to follow the route of that blood soaked cart. We're going to walk in the footsteps of some people who've changed the world. People like King Henry VIII, people like Queen Anne Boleyn, people like Sir Walter Raleigh. Are you ready to embark on a gruesome, gory journey of over 900 years? Yeah! yeah. Are you ready to follow me? Yeah! yeah. Follow me on Twitter! Yeah. yeah! Fair enough. Coming through now, a slow, slovenly and idle tourist. <laughs> Let's make them think they've missed out on something by spontaneously laughing after three. One, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> That concludes this block, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Come here. Right, everybody take two paces that way. Now two paces this way. <laughs> oh, my... No, I can't do that. <laughs> right, we're now standing in the outer ward of the Tower of London, that is to say, between the inner and outer bailing of a defensive wall. This wall here is 50 feet high. The outer one there, 45 feet thick. And down there is Min Street, so named because that was where all the coins of the British Empire were designed and produced until 1810. Now the buildings that house the factory are known as the Casemates, and they serve as not only a museum, which you can visit over there with the lovely Alice. Hello, Alice. <laughs> She's very bored. You need to go and visit the museum. <laughs> but also as accommodation for some of my Beefeater buddies and their families. So hands up, those of you who knew that Beefeaters like me actually lived inside the Tower of London. How many of you didn't know that? How many of you couldn't care less where we live? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Where are you from? <laughs> Santa Barbara. Never heard of it. <laughs> uh, right. You can see the second floor of windows over there. Behind those windows used to be the study to Sir Isaac Newton, who was the master of the mint here in the 17th century. And Sir Isaac Newton was a very clever man. He came up with the idea of milling the outside of coins to stop people clipping bits off the edges and making their own. And that's very clever, isn't it? He also invented gravity, a very fine British invention, invented right here in the town of London. <laughs> Before that, we just used to float about. <laughs> this is the bell tower, so named. It is a tower. It's got a bell. I blame you Americans for this. <laughs> Let me explain why. We give you a perfectly serviceable word, but you're not happy with that word. You need to know where it is and what to do on it. So we give you pavement. You have a sidewalk. We go riding. You go horseback riding. What part of the horse were you thinking of sitting on? <laughs> Bell Tower. Now, this is where Sir Thomas More was held for refusing to accept King Henry VIII as the supreme head of the church in England. At the same time, and for the very same reason, his very good friend John Fisher, the Bishop of Rochester, was held in the upper chamber. Both men were to suffer terribly for about 15 months, but could not be persuaded to abandon their beliefs. Were finally led out of these chambers, through the gates and up the hill, where they were publicly beheaded as traitors in 1535. Exactly 400 years later, both men were made saints in the Roman Catholic Church. Now, another man to spend a bit of time here was a man called James Scott. He was the Duke of Monmouth and the eldest of up to 17 illegitimate children of King Charles II. Now, after the death of his father in 1685, this incredibly handsome and popular young man was persuaded to stake his claim to the throne because his uncle, King James II, was a very unpopular Roman Catholic king. To press home his claim, James Scott landed in the west country of England and he marched inland gathering popular Protestant support in what is known as the Monmouth or Pitchfork Rebellion. That rebellion was crushed at the Battle of Sedgemoor on the 6th of July, 1685, but James Scott evaded capture by fleeing the battlefield. He hid in towns and villages for a few days, but was quickly caught and brought here to the tower. There was no need for a trial as he was condemned to death in his absence, and three days later he was led out of here, through the gates and up the hill. But this time, instead of being pelted with fruit and vegetables like everybody else, all the ladies came and they threw flowers in his path as he walked up in silence. That's how incredibly handsome and popular he was. He looked like me. <laughs> An inflatable version of William Shatner. <laughs> you have no idea who that is. <laughs> when he got to the top, he was met by the executioner, a man called Jack Ketch. I call him an executioner, but actually he was a part-time executioner. He was a local butcher and a full-time drinker. This combination led to one of the most botched, bloody and brutal executions in English history. Jack Ketch was not only drunk that day, we believe he even managed to bring the wrong type of axe to the execution. And he famously took eight strokes. The first one landed squarely in James Scott's left shoulder blade. The second one took the very top of his scalp off. The third one hit him in the right shoulder blade. And the fourth caught him in the lower lumbar region. At which point Ketch had given up. He threw the axe into the straw. He said, I can't go on. It's 30 guineas to a man who can. At which point the Sheriff of London poked him with his sword and said, you better pick that up, Jack, or you're going to be next. So he picked up the axe and went for the fifth stroke, but it was so wet with all the blood, it twisted in Ketch's hand and slapped James Scott squarely across the back of the head, which thankfully knocked him out. There were a further three botched attempts before it was obvious that Scott was dead, and even then the head remained stubbornly attached to the body. So Ketch improvised. He went down on his drunken knees, pulled out his butcher's knife, and to the stunned silence of the lovely ladies, proceeded to saw through the remaining stubborn sinew, tendon, gristle, skin and bones. Sweet dreams, kids. <laughs> Strangely, the head and the body were returned to the tower and sewn back together before burial, and we've absolutely no idea why. Now, of course, when James Scott was brought to the tower, he came through Traitor's Gate, which is our next destination. And it's now time to head off. Oh, come on, they can't all be jammed. ...in the world. This was built during the reign of King Edward I as he required a safer and more useful entrance into the tower. Rather than try and go over the narrow, crowded, twisted streets of London where convoys could be attacked, stores stolen and prisoners set free, he decided to use the River Thames as a highway. He had a hole punched through the outer defensive wall so that at high tide, boats could pass through these gates and unload their cargoes in safety. 
and therefore this was originally known as the Watergate. <laughs> yes, Americans. We had it here first. <laughs> now the king realised he weakened the defence of his premier fortress and he commanded that a tower be built above the gate to defend it. This is named in honour of a former constable of the Tower of London, Thomas Beckett. He, of course, was the Archbishop of Canterbury, murdered on the steps of Canterbury Cathedral in 1170, possibly on the orders of his former best friend, King Henry II, who lived here. So, if I have said this is called a Watergate, how then did it become known as Traitor's Gate? Well, that was down to the large numbers of alleged traitors to pass through those grim gates during the Tudor period, among them no less than three queens of England, mm -hmm. Queen Anne Boleyn, Queen Catherine Howard, and Lady Jane Grey. High dignities of the church and elder statesmen were no exception. Those and many more poor unfortunate souls would have travelled down from their trials at the Guild Hall or the Palace of Westminster, passed through these gates and climbed these stony steps. Here they'd be met by guards and escorted through the archways and off to their cells to await whatever fate had in store. And for some it would be a short journey to their place of execution. One of those horrible cells was in the infamous Bloody Tower. There it is. Originally known as the Garden Tower, its name was changed to the Tower of Blood or Bloody Tower during the Elizabethan period to commemorate the many tragic events that have happened within. Of them all, perhaps the saddest must be the alleged murders in 1483 of the two boy princes. Edward V was an uncrowned king and he had a little brother called Richard, the Duke of York. They were just 12 and 9 years old. And they were brought down from Ludlow Castle to prepare for Edward's coronation on the death of his father, who had died of dysentery in April of that year. They were supposed to have been looked after by their uncle, Richard, the Duke of Gloucester. But in June of that year, Richard declared those boys to be illegitimate. In July, he declared himself to be the king. And you know him as Richard III. By August, the sightings of the children had got fewer and fewer. And then we're told on one hot summer's evening, two men stole into those boys' bedrooms and murdered them in their beds, possibly by putting pillows over their faces and suffocating them. Their little bodies were then bundled down the steps leading into the Wakefield Tower, and they were hidden beneath some stones. The very next day, they were secretly removed and buried on the south side of the White Tower, and that's where they remained, undisturbed, for 191 years, until some workmen who were carrying out restoration work removed the stairwell and found the skeletal remains of two small boys. Experts of the day declared them indeed to be the missing princes. They were taken down to Westminster Abbey and reinterred in Innocence Corner, where they are to this day. So you are surrounded, ladies and gentlemen, by an awful lot of gory, gruesome history. And if you're from the British Empire, all this history is yours. And if you're American, Yee-haw! It could have been yours if only you paid your taxes. <laughs> Down there you can see the, uh, white, uh, the white, black and white building there. That's the Queen's House. It dates from 1540. It's the best preserved Tudor building in the city of London. Now, you can't go in there because that is now the home of the Constable of the Tower of London. And being the home of such a high-ranking official, it has sometimes been used to accommodate some very important prisoners. Prior to her execution in 1542, Queen Catherine Howard spent time in there. A man called William Penn spent eight months on the top floor for his offensive writing, was only released on the condition that he left the country, which, of course, he did. Eventually, he crossed the Atlantic and founded the Quaker colonies of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia. Anyone from there? You are? You must be very proud, sir. Your founding father was an English criminal. Well, at least he could write. That bell we gave you was founded just 500 yards on the other side of the glass building in the corner over there. When we gave you that bell, sir, it was in one piece. You lot broke it. Like you did our language. Yeehaw. It's pronounced aluminium, by the way. <laughs> That's the Beecham Tower. And in the Beecham Tower, 91 inscriptions carved into the walls by the prisoners. Some of the carvings are over 500 years old. On this side, you see the Chapel Royal. We're going to go in there very shortly. And finally, the largest of all our buildings, that's the Waterloo Block. That's named after 1974 Aberhead. <laughs> <laughs> Which one? Mamma Mia. Uh, <laughs> you see that queue that's going out? That's the queue to go and see the Crown Jewels and Royal Regalia. Ooh. Right, we're going to go and see the Chapel Royal, folks. So, gentlemen, as we go in, please take your headdress off. Ladies, you can keep your headdress on if you want. Uh, on the way in, please turn your cameras off, any other phones, that sort of thing. We're not allowed to take pictures in there. And please don't have your phones ringing or texting people in there. It's just distracting. Uh, and also, there's no eating or drinking in there. And uh, finally, ladies, be careful on the way in because there is a small step. And that step is haunted. 
and it trips up wicked and sinful women. <laughs> Don't you worry, you wicked sinful women, because I'm going to be waiting just inside the doorway with my arms outstretched, ready to catch you as you come flying through with no dignity whatsoever. <laughs> I'll then hold you close and tender to my bosom for what you're going to consider an inappropriate length of time. <laughs> I'm going to be quite busy, so gentlemen, if you trip and fall, it's really going to hurt. <laughs>